Okay, so welcome uh, to this event for uh, Eurocall's Teacher Outreach Workshop Day. Um, Eurocall is the European Association for Computer Assisted Language Learning. Um, and we're a community friendly association of researchers, educators, language teachers who are very interested in technology enhanced learning. You can find us uh, on Twitter um, at Eurocall Lang, on Facebook uh, and LinkedIn and our website as well. Uh, and we welcome all new members to come and join our community. Um, so as I said, we are researchers, practitioners, developers, um, passionate about using technology um, in learning and teaching languages and cultures. We have a big annual conference, which is just finished when I'm recording this. We have a range of special interest groups, um, a journal, Recall, um, an online journal, Eurocall Review, and as I said, various social media groups. So we would love it if you would join our community um, and become one of our members so that perhaps you could be giving um, a webinar online session like this one day. And so today um, I welcome Mara Fuertes, who's going to talk to us about teaching Spanish uh, and give us lots of good tips, um, partly in a, in a dialogue with me. Um, as we go forward, she's going to do some talking about her ideas and then she's going to introduce some kind of interactive sessions which you can do uh, while you're watching um, and while you're listening, uh, if you hit the pause button. Okay, so without further ado, Mara, I'm going to hand over to you. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here today. It is my pleasure to uh, uh, join you and to um, share with you my ideas on um, how to teach Spanish with Corpora. But bear in mind, we are using Spanish just a sort of case study, if you like. So uh, in a way, I hope that even if you don't teach Spanish, you can still apply all the um, uh, ideas and all the um, strategies that I'm going to share with you today uh, in your own um, in your own discipline in, in in the language that you that you currently teach. So uh, I must say I'm part of a team of uh, three colleagues um, who are currently designing uh, an open educational resource for teachers of Spanish uh, who wish to learn more about uh, how corpora can support language teaching and uh, language learning. And although it is only me here today, my colleagues Malena Abad Castillo from the um, Cervantes Institute in Manchester and uh, Rocio Diaz Bravo from the University of Granada in Spain uh, have also contributed to this presentation and um, have um, uh, are uh, heavily involved in this in this project. Uh, also, if you have any questions or if you want to uh, share any tips or any uh, issues, any uh, strategies with us, uh, there is a, uh, an email address uh, there that you can use, dia diasporic.identities at openac.uk. Uh, um, because um, this project is also part of a bigger project uh, uh, that aims at um, supporting teachers in their in their practices, uh, which is called um, diasporic identities and the politics of language uh, teaching, which is in turn part of a bigger project called Language Act and, and World Making that um, has been funded by the uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council for the past four years. So uh, with all the formalities covered, okay, um, I just um, uh, uh, during this uh, this presentation, I uh, just wanted to uh, introduce Corpora to you and uh, share how uh, it, they can be useful for language learning and, and teaching in um, sort of um, several different ways. So when we are uh, preparing our materials for our classes, but also when we are working with the students and also for our students when they are working independently. So um, I'm going to try and follow a little bit this, um, this overview and, uh, and see what happens. So um, uh, I, I suppose we could start by reflecting a bit what a um, um, corpora corpus is. Um, perhaps, I mean, not all of you are familiar with uh, 
corpora and the, depending on the language you teach, there might not be many available for you to use anyway. Good news is that although it, it, it can be time consuming, you can actually compile a corpus yourself. Uh, if you think it is it is worth um, investing the time on, on doing that. But uh, having said that, I suppose that in many languages, there are already a uh, corpus that can be used uh, for um, language learning and teaching. So just to make sure we are all um, you know, uh, uh, using the same terminology, uh, when uh, we talk about corpus or corpora in plural, we are sort of referring to a collection of written or oral texts that have been compiled for a particular uh, reason um, or with a particular aim or and following uh, some um, certain um, patterns and, and rules and in order for those texts to be part of this of this corpus. So um, uh, nowadays all corpora are uh, machine readable because they are uh, very, very, very big and, um, and they are available uh, on a regular basis, uh, open access. So you only have to click to be able to access um, a corpus on, on a regular basis. Maybe some specialized corpora are not, um, are not accessible to everybody, but I don't think they are so useful for language learning and teaching anyway. So a collection of texts that has been compiled um, following certain um, criteria is, is a corpus, uh, I would say. There are different types of uh, types of corpora, as you can see, and uh, here you have taxonomy based on uh, different criteria. So, depending on the language or languages involved, you have monolingual, multi or multilingual corpora, and also uh, you can find comparable corpora, which are uh, corpora that contain texts in more than one language, but those texts are similar, and then parallel texts that have corpus, cor uh, that have texts in um, more than one language, and but those texts are the same. So let's say, for example, um, a, corpor a, a corpora could contain uh, El Quixote plus its translations in, in many languages, and that would be a, a parallel a parallel corpus. Also, if we consider time, we could have diachronic corpora, that, um, let's say, um, take language and its evolution. So they cover a um, certain number of, of, of years uh, in the history of a particular language or synchronic uh, corpora that take uh, the language from just a particular uh, period of, of time and don't look at um, the evolution. Uh, if we look at currentness, we have a static corpora, which are those that have been closed and don't, uh, let's say, they don't add up any more texts um, nowadays. And other corpora, though, uh, aim at monitoring how language evolves and keep on adding texts as, as, as we go along. <laughs> And um, other corpora include learner corpora, which are um, corpus that have been created um, using texts from language students, oral or, or written. And we have also specialized corpora that, for example, uh, contain uh, conversations with a particular oral feature that we want to analyze or contain a particular linguistic variety that specialists want to study, for example. And obviously, there are multimedia corpora nowadays that include texts, uh, like written texts, audio and, and video, for example. So as you can see, the, this uh, taxonomy uh, is not uh, 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 
they, they all interact with each other so we can have a monolingual corpora, so Spanish corpora that is synchronic, so analysis, you know, picks up a period of time and focuses on compiling texts from that particular period of time, and they keep on adding texts, the authors keep on adding texts as, as we go along, so it's a monitor corpora, and it is multimedia because it includes mm, written, audio, and, and video uh, texts, if you, if you like. So I'm using text in a very wide, wide way here. So which one of these uh, are useful for language uh, teaching and language learning, do you think? Kate, can I put you on the spot? And which ones would you choose <laughs> intuitively, Gosh. if you like? I could, well, I could see uses for all of them, actually, uh, depending what you were teaching and what you wanted to mm -hmm. focus on. Um, I suppose in my teaching, I, I, I've used monolingual uh, corpus is corp corpora corpuses <laughs> um, to compare language, but I'm just thinking, you know, that idea of the time, you know, to compare, you know, how language has changed over time and, and its usage would be really interesting. And also, you know, the idea of parallel, you know, multiple. The example you gave, Don Quixote, multiple languages. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, really fantastic. So I, I, I can see a use for all of them. Is that the right answer? <laughs> Could be, yes, why not? It really, I think the right answer is actually, the, it depends on what you are teaching or what you really want to teach, you know. But I mean, I, I think that the obvious ones are perhaps, you know, corpora that, you know, focus on the language here and, and now, if you like. Mm -hmm. Also, corpora that are um, multimedia uh, nowadays, and of course, learner corpora that are going to help us, you know, to identify what are, for example, the most common mistakes students make at a certain level, etc. And that has a lot of potential, you know, to design materials, uh, exams, etc. But yeah, I, I, I think um, your answer was really, really, <coughs> really good. Thank you. Uh, so just to give you a, 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 a hint of how corporal look for those of you who might not be as familiar with, with them. Um, so in here, what I've done is I have gone to the website of uh, Corpus, which is the Corpus del Español del Siglo de Oro, so the Spanish of the uh, 21st century. This is a um, corpus compiled by the Real Academia Española, Spanish Royal Academy, and it, it is accessible um, online. And I have typed uh, um, Corpus uh, on the search uh, um, button. I've clicked on uh, Concordances, and this is what you find, okay? One of, the, one of the pages. So as you can see, it gives you the context in which mm -hmm. the um, a particular word uh, or term um, appears, okay? It does far more than this, because uh, you can click on um, coapariciones, which are the collocations, so, and, and you will find that. And also, as you can see it here, if you click on statistics, you get information about the areas where the word mm, is, is found, in, in this case, in, in the Spanish-speaking oh, uh, countries, as, as you can see, right? So I suppose you can, you know, start thinking about the potential of using this in class or for um, materials development, as, as you can see. So um, it's really interesting. This is a very, Show, Very sorry, just simple. To interrupt you, show, just I was just saying it's really interesting showing where you know where that where that word is most you you know the the geographical kind of breakdown is fascinating, isn't it? Yes, and I have chosen geographical, but you can change the parameters and see if it is more common in academic texts, in uh, scientific texts, in uh, informal texts, in uh, so. Uh, uh, for linguistic varieties, it is really, really, really good. So yes, it's, it's, this is. I wanted to highlight this feature because it's particularly interesting, I, I suppose. But there is a lot, <laughs> a lot of information that uh, you can find out uh, through through corpora. And here you have another example, which is the frequency, you know, of uh, of and, and the, the collocations. 
um, where um, this word again, corpus, appears uh, next to. So for example, uh, according to, to this table, as you can see, corpus teorico, so combining corpus with the adjective teorico is the most common collocation that you can find for this particular word, right? So, uh, or, and, and then the other one is recurso and so on and so forth. So as, as you can see, uh, when you want to teach vocabulary, for example, and you want to teach collocations, that is, or they call it coapariciones here, there is um, actually a lot of potential too, when you need to decide what to bring to the classroom and what not to, to bring, for example, can be really, really, really helpful. So this is what is called a general corpus, one of them, you know, in, in Spanish, there are, there are others, and they might look um, slightly different, but they all sort of do the same. It really depends on um, how the corpus has been built up. So some of them have uh, input from all the Spanish speaking countries up to one year, some of them go longer in time. Some of them only include information from a particular country, for example. So then I suppose uh, the first step, if you want to incorporate uh, these resources into your um, classroom, is get familiar with what is out there and uh, how this um, corpora has been, ha have been created. And it's usually very easy to find out because the website gives you all that information. Um, play a little bit with um, each one of them and see which one works uh, for you, depending on what you are what you're after, I suppose. Um, in in you know in parallel to this sort of corpora. Uh, we are lucky enough, at least in, in Spanish, to have um, quite a big learner corpora too. And in this case, the biggest one probably has been developed by the Instituto Cervantes in collaboration with the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and it's called uh, Corpus de Aprendices de Español, so Spanish Learners um, Corpora, and we know it by, by CAES. And um, again, in here, um, you can see what what can uh, you can look for frequency to frequencies etc but you can do searches um depending on you know the um uh, the word that that you want to look for but choose for example a particular word class if you like and then um, how you want your results to be to be displayed and interestingly you can filter it by the level of spanish from a1 to c C, um, C1, and then uh, the country, age, uh, text type, um, etc., and including uh, the ideal one. So this has got a lot of potential, <clears throat> for example, to um, identify what mistakes anglophones make, for example, and see how uh, we can we can support them um, in in this case. So to give you an example, in here I look for cartera, wallet, okay, just a random random one. And as you can see in here, okay, this is just a screenshot of, of what I what it appeared. Uh, it tells you the level of the of the student who has used this word. So some students at B1, but also one at A1. Their first language. Okay, so in this case we have Arabic and, and Mandarin. And uh, as you can see, they give you the context, but if you click in, in one of them, you have access to all the text where this word has been produced, for example. Okay, so again, a lot of um, information you know, here that, uh, that can be gathered and used again uh, in, in different ways, as we will see in, in a few minutes. Right, so. Uh, uh, over to you, in a way, Kay, again, uh, intuitively. Uh, do you see, can you see any advantages and, and disadvantages on, on using this sort of, of, of material and, and which ones are, are those? 
what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I saw a lot of advantages. I mean, do you mean for learning and teaching? Because immediately I was yes, struck sorry. by the re the research advantages, <laughs> obviously that that corporate. Sure, exactly. Corporate but I mean, I think the what I think the wonderful thing is, um, you know, seeing the context. One of those examples, uh, you, I think the first example you gave um, of corpus, you know, in the different contexts, I think uh, gives you that sense of how the word is actually properly used in action if you like um but but at the same time the different ways it's used in action and i think that can be a really rich kind of snapshot for students can't it um you know if you're if you're working with different vocabulary or if you're getting them to understand the way that different words are used um the the corpora can give you that snapshot quite quickly which then gives the student, I think, an idea to think about that particular word uh, and the nuances around the use of that particular word. And obviously, if you then go and look at the collocations um, that go with that word, it, it's sort of adding another level, isn't it? It starts to get in there and start to think about um, the way that language is used, looking at different perspectives. And I, and I think that's really useful, isn't it? I think in vocabulary development and writing development, but also just to to I think encourage a student just to think of in general about the way that their L2 is is being used um, in the wild in in real in real life. <laughs> so that's kind of a long a long advantage. <laughs> mm -hmm. What about uh, any drawbacks? Any any you know disadvantages? Any issues? Can you preempt perhaps any any? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, in some respects, I think um, when I've used corpora before as a teacher, a, a, a drawback, I would say, is um, on the teaching side, my level of knowledge of the corpora and how to use it. So, I mean, you gave some great examples there about kind of the, the richness of the information you can get. And I think from a teaching point of view, it's worth really exploring in some detail, isn't it? the functions of different um, corpora and then stepping back and thinking about how that might support some aspect of teaching in the classroom. Um, I think, you know, we're all quite busy. When I've used corpora before, I've gone in quite quickly and I think probably at quite a superficial level and probably just haven't used them as well as I could. So possibly um, a drawback is something around the time. You know, um, I think teachers need to think about the, the time it might take just to get get really um, a good level of knowledge about how they can use the functions of the corpora. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I completely agree. And actually, you know, I think you've said <laughs> everything I had thought about too. So obviously um, it's, it's quite easy to see how um, uh, corpora promotes discovery learning, as, as you mentioned, and in fact, it uh, uh, adheres to communicative principles because um, um, it, it also, you know, supports sort of um, this uh, curiosity, if you like, and uh, encourages students to do, be researchers of the of the language, you no, know, and and explore and investigate a, a little bit, you know, a more in depth um, what you know languages uh, or, or a particular language um, uh, shows and, and and display in that in that respect. And actually, um, it is interesting to note that um, there is a recent. Uh, meta-analysis that has been done by um, Bolton and Cobb and is quoted at the end. Um, and uh, they concluded actually that corpora in language learning and teaching and um, leads to gains in nearly all contexts and all levels and modalities yeah. and all areas, you know. So, um, but um, we must admit though that um, as you rightly mentioned, um, as language educators, we need to develop uh, new skills and uh, in order for us to fully, you know, see and um, acknowledge what corpora have to have to offer. 
and that takes a lot of time, so it can be quite time-consuming, and uh, it is not, it, it, it might not necessarily be a priority among, you know, yeah. language uh, educators in, in that respect. And um, because first of all, we need to investigate which corpora are available, and then uh, how the interface uh, work each time, which is not necessary. It might be similar, but not necessarily the same. It is a little bit uh, what happens with Blackboard Collaborate and then Teams and then Zoom and then Adobe <laughs> Connect. You know, they oh, it, it, it is quite <laughs> yeah. uh, comparable, you know, situation. You know, so there are all there. They all sort of do the same, but they are slightly different, and you need to learn, you know, how to uh, manipulate um, all of them in in a way, so um, because only if we develop sort of um, advanced search and, and analysis skills, we can, you know, uh, make the most out of out of them and decide, you know, on the best modality of use in in our teaching practices. Mm -hmm. In in a way, you know, and it, and also if we want to um, uh, facilitate. Uh, to students, you know, um, the, the, their approach to, to corporate too. So, uh, um, uh, and one of the problems at the moment is that there is not that much um, ready-made materials, you know, mm -hmm. using corpora that we can adapt and, and we can use in, in our own practices. So perhaps, as some authors mm -hmm. suggest, uh, the, the best well, the most appropriate thing to do would actually be to gain. Uh, can I just can I just come in on that? I mean, I, I think you're yes. I think you're right. That, that thing about there not being many ready-made materials, I think that's really a key element because I think you, as a teacher, you need to be quite creative, don't you? You look at a, exactly. you look at corpora, you choose one, and it does look quite um, mechanical. I mean, it, you know, it looks quite forbidding and I think you do need to be quite creative don't you to get past that and understand the functionality and also how you can make it useful and interesting for your students so I think it it, um, it would be useful to have ready-made kind of materials and guidance wouldn't it to, to help exactly. you make that journey a bit quicker. I agree exactly uh, something that can inspire you and uh, I suppose that language teacher, we are in a way we very keen on sharing, etc. And sometimes, you know, in conference such as Eurocall, etc., you see a lot of um, ideas on uh, projects that have been applied into a particular teaching context, and uh, you think, oh, I could actually do this, you know, and then modify and start exploring a new app or a new, you know, software, uh, uh, testing a new idea, etc., in, in your own context. And I think with Corpora, um, we are not at that point just yet, mm -hmm. uh, apart from obviously in, um, in um, ESOL, uh, EFL, etc., where corpora have been around a bit longer, so their application into uh, English language um, uh, teaching and, and learning is is a bit more, you know, developed uh, too. So, but there there has been quite a lot of research actually in how corpora can be beneficial for language um, teaching and learning. So I wonder if um, the answer to this is, again, uh, bridging the gap between researchers and, and practitioners, you know, through training and the textbooks maybe, and, you know, recordings, sessions, workshops, etc., cetera, and, uh, and consider how, you know, those materials uh, uh, can be developed and even, you know, develop just a pedagogic corpora that might be easier to navigate through than this uh, generic corpora that, I mean, in all honesty, haven't been developed specifically for language learning and, and teaching. Yeah. So there might be some interesting projects <laughs> there. But in the meantime, I suppose <laughs> uh, uh, we can try and make some suggestions on, on how to use what we what we have in in hand in in a way. Um, something 
I think uh, part of the beauty of corpora is that, um, as, as it is mentioned in the advantages, is that uh, there are uh, genuine examples of language use. And sometimes it's quite tricky to find authentic materials that you uh, want to use to demonstrate a particular linguistic feature of the language. For example, sometimes you see a beautiful video that you think, oh, this would be great in class, but then it doesn't fit with your linguistic aims <laughs> for that particular, uh, you know, in, in for that particular class or in that particular syllabus or, or curriculum, you know. So, whereas with corpus, uh, you do the opposite process. So you already have a huge database full of texts, and then you can actually look for the linguistic feature uh, that you, you want to demonstrate and boom, all of the sudden, all that authentic mm -hmm. material pops up <laughs> and is, is ready for you to, to pull out and, and use. So I, I see that as a huge advantage compared to going to the wild website, you know, world of internet, trying to look for authentic materials that uh, combine uh, the, the, you know, that also demonstrate that, as I say, a particular linguistic feature. But if we quickly move into, you know, how we can use corpora materials development, I have a couple of examples that I can share if you like to see if they uh, inspire you and, and we can discuss them further if you if you think they are useful. And this okay. one, com they, they combine uh, learner corpora and, um, and generic corpora. So first of all, I mean, the, the first generic use uh, of, um, of learning corpora could be, uh, you know, to conduct any its analysis. Sorry, I wrote this in Spanish. I was, com <laughs> I've just noticed I was <laughs> combining both languages and this is written in Spanish. My, my apologies. Good. Um, <laughs> cognate. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, so for example, um, Anglophones usually, um, you know, uh, struggle with the difference of uh, quales and que es. So first of all, I can go and check in a learner corpora uh, how um, English learners of Spanish use quales and que es. And I can do a quick search and when doing the search in, in this learner um, corpora, I quickly can see uh, when I type both combinations in, 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 and I search for those combinations in, in the corpus, I can quickly see that quales is not problematic. However, case is problematic. And I just click and I see it, right? Uh, and then uh, I can see that the problem lasts up to B2. Uh, interesting. So, uh, interesting. Yes, can, can you see? Because in here, they are using it, uh, uh, you know, I don't like to say correct, but they are using it according to the grammar rules of Spanish. In here, there are mistakes, right? So, uh, so now I know I need to focus on KS and I don't need to focus so much on quales, right? Interesting. And then, uh, so, so case really needs to be taught in depth because the mistake is made in at all levels, you know, so I, and I wanna avoid it to be um, fossilized, mm -hmm. right? So uh, to avoid um, fossilization. So this is my first conclusion, no? that, um, I need to my students to work on the segment case because if they are anglophones and and, and in this corpora in this corpus many anglophones are making these mistakes I can assume my students are gonna make it too and then I can move into um, a generic corpora and I can search um, uh, the same segment. In a, in a generic corpora to see where it appears. So this is done in a native corpora in CAES, the one I showed you before, and there are many, 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 many results, you know, pages and pages. Mm -hmm. 
but something that, that I can see very, very quickly is that this segment is very common. ¿Qué es lo que? Can you see? ¿Qué es lo que? Yeah. ¿Qué es lo que? ¿Qué es lo que? Yeah. ¿Qué es lo que? ¿Qué es lo que? It's very, very frequent. Can you see? It's not, yeah. it, 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 it's not the only combination, but this combination is, is, is very common. So immediately, uh, I can design an activity in the classroom that contains this segment because its frequency in general Spanish is very common, it's very high, right? Mm -hmm. So can you see how I have interacted here with both? Is this clear enough, Kate? You see? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, I mean, you've given that example as one example. I mean, how have you identified that example in, in the beginning? Because, I mean, it obviously, um, are you just sort of choosing particular phrases you think there have been issues with? Because obviously you couldn't, you couldn't apply the whole of the Spanish language no. you know, and do this for every, every single phrase. So obviously you are choosing, no. making some choice, aren't you, in the beginning? And how have you... How would you normally go around that kind of choice to do this kind of activity? Well, uh, it might come up from my syllabus. So in my syllabus, I might have, for example, a teach. Oh, we've lost your sound for a minute. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, I think you've had a connection problem. I think we've lost Mara for a moment. I'm sure she will try to come back in. We lost her talking about KS uh, Loke um, in a concordancer. And I'm hoping she can come back into us. I don't know if you can hear us. Hear me, Mara. Okay, I'm back. Ah, I you're think. back. <laughs> Sorry, I don't yes. know what happened. Yeah, we can, we can see you and hear you again. Okay, carry yes. on. <laughs> Sorry, sorry about that. So yeah, sometimes um, it's a traditional. This is this is uh, an example of something that uh, anyone who teaches Spanish to Anglophones know they struggle with. So I'm just suggesting a, an alternative way to, to look into it. Sometimes, as I was saying, it's something that comes from your syllabus. And um, in your syllabus, I don't know, in this particular case, uh, you have to teach the difference between different types of past tenses in Spanish. And you uh, want to, for example, check <clears throat> what are the most common mistakes uh, made in those past tenses and the, how we can, um, you know, and where they appear in uh, general Spanish and design an activity around that. So uh, obviously, yeah, as you were saying, you, we, we cannot go through all the Spanish language and, and do this sort of thing. So, but it, it's up to, you know, you as a um lecturer and and as a as a or as a teacher and your own knowledge about you know the language and how it works and what your students struggle with to to decide in in a way you know just you know and this is just a classic example if you like of something yeah. uh, a students struggle with does this answer your Question. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great example you've given there in in those two things that you you've done. You know the the comparisons and understanding when it's a problem, and then coming here to see how often it's used. Um, I think that's great. Yeah, it's a very okay. very clear useful example. <laughs> uh, something else uh, that that you can do with corpora and uh, it's um, you know just for for class preparation is uh, uh, look for examples. Maybe you are covering something, and uh, I must admit, sometimes I struggle to find examples because you keep on using, you know, John went to, blah, 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 blah. you know what I mean? Whereas 
uh, if you are, mm -hmm. I don't know, demonstrating how a verb works or how a particular structure works, you can just go to the corpus, type it, and you don't even need to use those examples. They can just be inspiration and you can modify them, etc. But it is quite a quick way to uh, look for for examples of, again, authentic material. Um, something else that is interesting is uh, when you have two words that are nearly synonyms or close synonyms. So for example, in Spanish, I don't know, happiness and joy, alegría and, and you know, felicidad and, and alegría. Sometimes you can go to a corpus and type where each one of them appears mm -hmm. and show students, you know, uh, sentences and examples of each one of them in their context. And uh, it could be a way for them to, to see the difference and how they can, they, they appear in, in, in different uh, contexts. Mm -hmm. um, also with the function of frequency, uh, you can actually uh, decide which vocabulary you want to teach. So for example, maybe you are teaching uh, the weather, for example, and uh, there are a lot of words to describe the weather in, in any language, I suppose, but obviously you cannot teach them all in one go. Um, so perhaps using frequencies and checking which words are more frequent in in a particular language, not to, to um, uh, to talk about uh, the weather can help you decide which ones you are including in your materials and which ones uh, you are uh, leaving out, for for example. So um, it could be that this is a, a, a using the frequency uh, function of, of corpora that tells you how uh, how many times a particular word appears in, in, in the database <coughs> can be a nice way to, to decide uh, if you want to include that particular word in, in your materials or not. Also, some corpus offer you the possibility of uploading a text and checking frequencies in, in that, that particular text. Mm -hmm. And that could be very useful to decide if the level of a text is appropriate for your students or not. And you have an example there in blue. So as you can see, uh, in this text, that if we were considering, for example, to use it for uh, B1, we can see that uh, the, uh, the text has, uh, well, is close to uh, 200 words, uh, of which 70% are quite frequent in Spanish, and 8% are medium, and then uh, 23% are, are not as frequent and they are highlighted in different colors as you can see. So with this in mind, you could say, okay, I think, uh, you know, at B1, B2, they should be able to cope, you know, with this sort of uncertainty <laughs> in, mm. in a text, you know, considering if you know about 80% of the, of, you know, the words in the text. Uh, you are able to understand it, for example, no? And then this also gives you information about the potential words that you will need to include in a vocabulary list or those words that your students might not be so familiar with because they haven't come up as frequently as others, you know, in the previous text, in book text that they, they might have read. Is this clear? Is it clear? Is it... <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. I mean, I'm nodding. Yeah, I, I think that's a fabulous activity. Um, I mean, it, it's so rich, isn't it? I mean, you've got the text, you've, you know, come up with it, created it, whatever, you input it, and it gives you that level of information um, to then help you, as you say, help, help you focus on the vocabulary, help you understand you've got the level right, but then um, presumably help you, you know, when you're preparing for things that there might be a challenge to students that you might anticipate questions about <laughs> or that exactly. might help you help you prepare the feedback in advance if you like because you kind of think well I have a feeling there might be issues around the you know those particular unusual words so I think that's exactly. marvelous yeah mm -hmm. exactly I think with feedback you know we can uh, uh, you know uh, you can prepare feedback based on the potential mistakes that you might identify in a learner corpora, for example. So um, 
it's, it's, it's quite quite rich as as you were saying mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. also you know for for materials development again you know you can use um examples taken from from a corpora to sort of uh, uh, build up um, a drill exercise if you if you like and also uh, you can pull out texts as a you know as a whole that uh, your students can can read them etc so in here for example this text has a lot of um, information about the weather uh, seasons etc so um, you can look for those sort of um, terms in in the in the corpus and then pull out texts that meet your your um, criteria for for example so if, um, if we are working uh, collocations related to um, the weather uh, we can look for a particular collocation such as i don't know rayos y truenos and then uh, in fact uh, we discover this text from rojas marcos that on top of that collocation has more and that can you know and so you can bring it to the to the classroom for for example so um a lot of potential to to develop uh, mm -hmm. uh, materials too and again yeah you can use it for assessment purposes too you can use so for example uh, we can use concordances uh, to create a uh, multiple choice items or fill in the gaps as, as you have in the in the example and um, with collocations for example we can prepare matching exercises you know uh, pulling out collocations from from a corpus and the the texts the videos the audios that are included in a multimedia um, corpus or in multimedia corpora can be used as input text for um, listening and reading comprehensions. So again, all these materials that can be, you know, can be uh, are part of. Oh, hello, we have Carla here, I think. Unmuted. Yeah, Car Carla has joined us. Uh, Carla's going to be uh, doing our next session. Um, so uh, welcome, Carla. Welcome. Um, we're just concluding this session, so please join in if you wish to. Yes. Carry on, Mara. <laughs> yes. No, I, I just wanted to give a couple of more examples of what is called data-driven learning. So when you in actually involve your students in, in using um, corpora, so let me see. Yeah. So, uh, for example, you could ask students to go to um, a, one of the um, corpus that we um, that we have been um, looking at, and uh, I'm actually gonna do it live. Wish me luck. I hope nothing collapses, <laughs> but let's see. Luck. Okay, let's give it a try. So, in a separate, you should be my, see my screen now. And on a, on a separate screen, you have the, um, you know, you should see. Um, yes, corpus. we can see that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. So in here, you see the main screen. So, for example, you could add students to look for a carro. Okay. And uh -huh. click on statistics. And in here, okay, something that comes up is that um, uh, this word is very common in the um, continental uh, Caribbean and then in, in uh, Mexico and Central America. Uh, this is a way to say car in Spanish, but then we also have coche. Okay, so I'm gonna repeat uh, another group mm -hmm. of students would type coche, for example, and click okay. on statistics. And if it works in here, what we find oh. out is that it is mainly used in in Spain, as you can see. And there's a third way to say car in Spanish, which is auto. Okay, so we type auto. Well, this this is the concordances, but we, we would click on statistics. And in here, auto, mm -hmm. we find out that is um, 
heavily used in the Rio de la Plata, so uh, Uruguay, Argentina, etc. Right. So uh, by doing this very simple exercise with our students, um, they could draw some conclusions and they could uh, either um, you know do the three searches or just one per group, something on those lines and you know, doing it a little bit more in depth, obviously, we could um, ask students to, you know, to uh, do it, uh, as I say, a little bit more in depth. And it is an easy way to introduce them to these tools that have a lot of potential because, as, as you can see, in a couple of clicks, we find out uh, which form for car is more common in different areas of the Spanish-speaking countries, if you if you like. So um, it is sort of a, a quick way to find out this sort of information and, and uh, also a, a nice way for our students to, to introduce their, um, uh, to introduce them to, to this sort of, you know, materials and, yeah. and, and tools. Uh, so to conclude, for some reason, uh, sorry, um, Kate, I cannot share back my. I knew this could happen, you know. I I, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot share my file. But if you can do it, maybe you you still have. Um, I know. Right, yeah. right. As a moderator, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Okay, let me go. Yes. Share files. Thank you. There we Let's try. Okay, there we go. I've. I'm. Sh Oops. Which slide? Hang on. Okay. Uh, it's not working, is it? it, it uh, it's working. It's, it's saying, um, okay. It's the third one, I think. Is it? I cannot see that. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Very quickly. Right. So, in here, you ha I had done it before, just in case, you know. So, as you can see, um, uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, just a screenshot of what we have just seen, you know, but it, it would be a very quick way, you know, uh, to uh, give students the opportunity to do some searches. Other ideas, you know, for our students to use corporate, just ask them to look for examples. For example, idioms uh, are, are a nice one as well to investigate through, through corpora. They can create word maps and uh, investigate linguistic uh, varieties such as colloquialisms or dialects as, as we have just seen and we can even make it competitive so give them a list of words such as chacina, chungo, uh, chingada, apologies, you know, chubasquero, chipcha, chorea, etc. and ask them to make a guess and check and then check in the corpus if their guesses are all right or or not, for example. So, as I say, many different ways to encourage students uh, to to use um, the corpus in, in corpora in class, and also for uh, independent learning too. So we can invite them to um, explore a particular topic, and then people back in in class, or even use, for example, frequencies uh, to prepare writing. Um, composition or, or an assignment. So, for example, if they have to write about uh, Hernán Cortés, they can type Hernán Cortés in the, um, in the corpus and see which are the most common um, combinations or concordances of this particular term and then start writing their um, task uh, using those um, collocations if you like or, or concordances so for example in here clearly conquistador and conquista are very frequent you know collocations now very question too so perhaps be careful with it. it's not the best example maybe uh, and um, so this is a way for our students also to um, get inspiration, if you like, or activate some vocabulary, some collocations, etc., that might come up, might be useful, as I say, for writing tasks or or assignments. Um, uh, if they need to write a, an ad, for example, we can type a publicidad, 
in, in the corpus, and see which are the verbs that come up more frequently related to uh, this field. So students can, you know, get familiar with them and, and use them for, for example. Uh, so just to, to conclude, um, as, as I hope I have shown you, uh, corpora can influence the syllabus, you know, and can, that, um, can help you to decide what to teach and what not to teach, uh, if that is what, you, what you're after. I want to insist on the fact that they are a fantastic source for authentic material and sometimes it's easier to go through a corpus than you know just search uh, online depending on what you what you're after for your for your classes um, also uh, they can support the students in confirming what they already know about uh, the about languages and uh, they can uh, support them in learning those details and uh, subtle differences in, in in language. And also something that I particularly like, and I know not everybody might agree with this, but it allows them to be curious about the language. It allows them to go that step forward in what they know, and, and it has that sort of discover um, you know how the a particular language works a little bit more in depth without having to go into a lot of meta language or you know or a lot of specialized terms or having to look for something in a grammar but it's, it's quite easy you know to so it is a nice approach to an advanced um, look at a um, the, the language and is you you only have to click as as, as I was saying. So if you want to know more, you know I, I this would be the first um, points of uh, sort of <laughs> um, the first um, resources that I would look into. And uh, um, I think this is me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I, I think you've you've demonstrated so well how wonderful the use of corpora can be in language learning and teaching. Um, that was fantastic. So many great examples there. Um, and I'm sure um, people will find that really useful uh, to listen to in terms of the examples and to know what to do to get across, get across that idea that corpora are just kind of... Um, very difficult to access and understand what to do with. I think you've shown us what we can do. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording just now. Thank you. Just you. bear with me.